I'm Katie Hughes, and I'm a software engineer at No Red Inc. I've been there since February, writing Elm code in production. Now, I know that the question on everyone's mind right now is, who is your favorite superhero? Well, obviously, that's the unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl has the proportional speed and strength of a squirrel. She can speak to squirrels, she has a prehensile squirrel tail, and, like most squirrels, she has rarely used retractable knuckle spikes. Eat your heart out, Wolverine. Squirrel Girl was introduced in the 90s <laughs> by Will Murray and Steve Ditko. She was a juxtaposition of just how gritty comics had gotten in the 90s. She was a plucky young 15-year-old mutant who just wanted to be partners with Iron Man and ended up defeating Doctor Doom with her army of squirrel friends in her very first issue. Squirrel Girl was rebooted in 2015 with Ryan North as the writer and Erica Henderson as the artist. This is actually a piece I got commissioned by Erica Henderson of Squirrel Girl and Supergirl pair programming. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why uh, Squirrel Girl matters to a tech conference and the reason why uh, she is pair programming is because in the reboot, she is a computer science major at university. Ryan North has his master's in computer science, so not only are their jokes top notch, but she'll often use computer science foundations to solve problems and fight crime. The reason why she matters to an Elm conference is the unique way she fights crime. She doesn't just aggress the other character, but she works with them and uses her empathy to create context to provide a better solution. She'll ask, why are you knocking down this building? Oh, it's because you like knocking down buildings? Have you tried a job in construction? And that's something that actually <laughs> happens. <laughs> to me, that sounds like a little compiler we all know. I get the same <laughs> sense of delight. <laughs> I get the same sense of delight reading Squirrel Girl that I do writing Elm Code. They're both incredibly charming. So surprise, you're not at Comic-Con, and my job isn't to stand up here and tell you to read Squirrel Girl. I wrote a project uh, because it turns out Marvel has an API. They have a comics endpoint, which allows you to find all the characters that were in that comic, and they have a character's endpoint, which allows you to find all the comics that character has been in. So this relationship made me think of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, one person will propose an actor, and then another person tries to connect that actor in six connections or fewer to Kevin Bacon. The person who's able to do it in the fewest amount of connections wins. So in our Marvel version of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, who should be our Kevin Bacon? Obviously Squirrel Girl. <laughs> I'm incredibly biased, but I did come up with a good reason why she would be a good root character, and that's because she has lots of connections in fewer comics. Imagine Spider-Man was our root character. He's been in probably a billion comics. We would have to search through every single one of those billion comics just to flesh out the very first degree. And if our tree starts out that big, this is an exponentially growing problem. So we would have to search through so many people to f or so many comics to find probably a lot of repeated characters. If we start with Squirrel Girl, she's been in a lot fewer comics. However, she has characters who bring a big punch. She's befriended Kraven the Hunter, who is one of Spider-Man's foes. She's befriended Galactus by providing him a planet full of nuts as opposed to Earth to consume. <laughs> and she did successfully befriend Iron Man. So it's a lot of very important characters in fewer comics, making her more of an efficient root character. So Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon is a really cool game for movie buffs, but it's also great for graph theory. <laughs> what we have here is the shortest path problem. Given two nodes, find the shortest path between them. So we have graph theory, and we have an API. Who else should join this party but GraphQL? <laughs> it turns out that there is a GraphQL wrapper for the Marvel API called MarvelQL by Nuvum. Backing up a little bit, or a lot of it, What's the point of this project besides giving myself a platform to tell a bunch of people to read Squirrel Girl? Well, the technical question I wanted to answer with this project was what is it like to use a GraphQL server you don't own? Being at No Red Inc., a lot of my GraphQL experience is owning the GraphQL server. If there is a query that's not quite optimized or if I don't have a use case that's covered by the existing endpoints, I can go in and change it myself. Marvel QL is actually open source, so I could have gone in and changed things myself, but for the sake of this, I wanted to treat it as a black box. 
what problems and solutions arise when I don't have access to that GraphQL server. I ended up with my project looking something like this. We have six degrees of Squirrel Girl, where you can search for a character like Storm, connect that character to Squirrel Girl, and it prints out Storm is an A plus X, number three, with Black Panther, who is an Age of Heroes, with Squirrel Girl. So, what I learned and want to pass on to you is that when you're using a third-party API, you need to be flexible. And when you're caching, you should aim for simplicity first. And then we'll have an after-school special at the end. So to start off our story arc with our very first issue, we have GraphQ Squirrel. In order to uh, fully appreciate what GraphQL can bring to the table, let's first talk about REST. Let's talk about the worst case scenario with no uh, optimizations or anything and a very simplistic API. So in the REST API, we have two endpoints. Characters, which allows you to get information on that character, including all the comics that character has been in, but just the IDs of those comics. And then we have a comics endpoint, which gives you information on that comic and all the characters that have been in that comic, but just the character's IDs. So I pulled a few numbers so we can do something fun. Math. We, over 100 characters, I found that on average, there are 10 comics per character. And over 100 comics, I found that on average, there are three characters per comic. Now, there were a lot of comics that apparently have zero characters, which doesn't seem right and doesn't give me the most faith in my data, but we'll just go with it. The numbers are going to get huge, so I'll deal with a small number. So, to spell this all out, in order to get the very first, like, what comics have Squirrel Girl been in? We have one API call to the character's endpoint to get all the IDs for those comics. Saying Squirrel Girl is an average character, she's in 10 comics. So then that's 10 API calls to the comic endpoint to get information on each of those comics. And then if there are two characters in that comic who aren't Squirrel Girl, that's two additional API calls to the character endpoint to get information on those characters to fully flesh out the very first degree. Now for each of those characters, you have to call 10 API calls and then two character calls to get the second degree. So that's 10 times two to the second. And then this grows exponentially for the third, it's to the third degree. Spoiler alert, first degree is 10 times two to the one. Squirrel girl is 10 times two to the zero. And this totals up for our very naive abreast only solution to 67,368,421 possible API calls which is a lot. Um, even if I wanted to make that many API calls, the thing about dealing with a third-party API is you have rate limits. So I only have 3,000 API calls within 24 hours. So enters the hero of our story, GraphQL. I'm gonna deal with some predictions because when I was first proposing this talk, I was like, oh, I'll just kind of like guess what the API is. So I guessed that there would be a character's endpoint, which gives me the character object, and then all of the comics that that character has been, because GraphQL is all about modeling relations, I kind of guessed that those comics would be fully fleshed out comic objects, so then I can continue nesting and exploring the relations. And then comics, same thing but reverse, that they would have an array of the fully fledged character objects, so then I can continue exploring those relationships. If that's true, this could possibly be done in one API call. It wouldn't be great, it wouldn't be fast, would not recommend it, but it looks something like this. We get character where name is Squirrel Girl, we get all the comics she's been in, and then for each of those comics, each nested object here is a, nested, is a exponentially more uh, query here. So for each of those comics, we get all the characters in them. For each of those characters, that's our first degree, we continue on to get the comics and then characters, second degree, so on and so forth until this is all six degrees. Because we will always start with Squirrel Girl and we will never go past six degrees, this lets us search for any character with one API call because we've loaded in the entire connections graph and then it's just a matter of traversing through that graph. However, this is just pushing the problem of all of those REST API calls from my problem to the server's problem. So I have to wait that long, however long it takes the database and the API to calculate all of these relationships before I can even give my first response. So how do we make this better? Well, my proposal is breaking it out by degree. Let's get character where Squirrel Girl, 
is the name, and then get all of her comics and get all the characters in those comics. Let's say we get back Tippy Toe, Squirrel Girl, Squirrel Friend, and Craven the Hunter, Squirrel Girl's human friend. Then we can make a second call for the second degree. This is, uh, GraphQL allows you to batch queries together, and that's what this arrow is denoting. It's just a very narrow query and a very wide slide. And so we get character Tippy Toe and get character Craven the Hunter, and we get each of their comics and each of their characters, and that fleshes out our second degree. So in this scenario, we have one API call per degree, which means at max, we traverse through the entire, the entire tree, which gets us six API calls, which is far less than 3,000 API calls. So that's great. We're in business. Let's go. Enters Elm GraphQL. So my experience with Elm GraphQL has been at no red ink. Again, we own the server code, and we have some script that generates our Elm GraphQL client code, and I'm, I've only worked in it. I haven't actually started anything with Elm GraphQL, so I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I was expecting some sort of big script I was going to have to write, so I scrolled through the docs, being like, I don't know how I'm doing this. And then I realized I was making it way too complicated, and all it was was this one line. I downloaded the Elm GraphQL CLI tool, gave it the server API or the server URL, gave it what to name the base object and where to put all the code. So this is way simpler than I thought it was going to be. So thank you, Dylan Kearns, for making that really easy. <laughs> so now let's talk about mostly real API time. Before I was making some assumptions on the GraphQL side, it turns out that my actual character's query looks something like this. Note, in the comics, we're just getting the name and the resource URI, not the characters. This brings us to our first conflict in this story. So I wasn't sure what shape this comics thing was, and I went to the GraphQL playground. A lot of GraphQL servers provide something like this, where you can test out your queries and, in my case, look up documentation. So I looked up what this comics object was, and it turns out it's a summary object. A lot of the endpoints in, the graph, in this GraphQL server uses the summary object to model nested objects as opposed to a fully fleshed out comic or a fully fleshed out character. So that means that my, what I wanted was one API call per degree. Now I'm going to have to do two API calls per degree because I get character Squirrel Girl, get information on her comics, and then I'll use some information in there to get comic, and then we could batch all these comic API calls together like we saw with Tippy Toe and Craven the Hunter. And now we're in a situation where we have two API calls per degree, which is 12 calls total, still less than 3,000, so I think this is probably good. So moving to totally real, I actually tried this query because I was making an assumption like, oh, I can look up a character by their name. Surely I can look up a comic by its title. Turns out you can't. I also tried name. That also didn't work. So I went to my summary data to see what am I working with. Well, my resource URI is actually the rest endpoint for that comic. At the end of that rest endpoint is the ID for that comic. Surely I can look up a comic by its ID. You also can't do that. So I went back to GraphQL Playground and looked up the information on what exactly is this comic where input instead of just guessing at what I can send it. I'll save you skimming through this. This is another conflict. Turns out that there is no overlap between the summary data and the comic where input. So I have no way to get what I, what I got from a character and then move that to continue exploring the graph via GraphQL with the comics endpoint. And this brings us to our first lesson. Be flexible, even if it turns out you can't fully use the technology you proposed your talk on. So, <laughs> I had to go back to summary data, and I tried my best to channel my inner squirrel girl, and instead of forcing GraphQL into this problem, I looked at the bigger picture and worked with it. And like I said, I have this resource URI, which is the REST endpoint. I went to the documentation on the REST endpoint, and it, find, and it turns out that there are some additional things I can add to the end. So I can take this comics URI and add slash characters at the end. And before, when we were just getting the IDs of the characters that were in this comic, now with slash characters, I can get the fully fleshed out characters object, which includes 
all of the comics that those characters have been in. So now I'm in a situation where I have one GraphQL call to start, and then for the rest, I use REST. Let's revisit my worst case scenario calculation with 67 million. That was because we started one character API call for Squirrel Girl, 10 for all of her comics, two for each of those characters, but now we have a comics API that gives us information on the characters. So we've cut each of those down by a factor of 10. Or nope, by a factor of two. And then uh, our first degree is taken over by GraphQL. So that gets us to 1,111,101, which is less than 67 million, but it's still more than 3,000. <laughs> so this brings us to our second issue in the story arc, storing nuts for the winter, AKA caching. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, my model, essentially. We have pending comics and working connections on the left. That is directly into my model by those exact names. So to give you more of an idea of how my application works, let me tell you the story of my data. My data starts off in pending comics. A pending comics is the queue for it, comics that we need to make API calls for. Once an API response comes back for a certain comic, we dequeue it from pending comics and start adding to the working graph, which I called asked within my working connections. And then we build up each connection per those characters that were in that comic. So we get Tippy Toe, connect her to the comic, Craven the Hunter, connect him to the comic, and then attach those to the parent ID. In that case, that would be the parent ID for Squirrel Girl. At the end, we'll be able to trace back up all those parent IDs to finally calculate our answer. Spider-Man's parent ID is number two. Number two is Craven the Hunter. Craven the Hunter's parent ID is number one. Number one is Squirrel Girl. Great, we got an answer, and then we store it in our found connection. And ultimately, we get Storm is an A plus X, number three with Black Panther, who is an Age of Heroes trade paperback with Squirrel Girl. So let's say I search for Storm and Storm again. Well, I don't wanna make a bunch of API calls again, much less traverse through all of that working tree when I just did all of that work. So my very first cache is an answers cache. I store that answer I built up, indexed by the character's name, and then my application will check the cache first before making any API calls. This worked out great and was very uninteresting to talk about. So let's talk about the one I had more problems with, the mediating steps cache, though like building up that working connections graph. So six, connect, six degrees of scroll girl is a shortest path problem. So that means we can use breadth first search. By that I mean we want to fully exa exhaust the first level before we search to the next level. So if we start with Squirrel Girl, the yellow node, and we're trying to find Spider-Man, the red node, we don't have to search through the second level to find second Spider-Man if we had fully exhausted that first level. And to expand upon that more, say we're searching for someone who's connected to Squirrel Girl, or to Spider-Man, We've already started exploring Spider-Man number one's graph, so we don't need to explore Spider-Man number two's graph because it's still Spider-Man. So when we explore, when we find Spider-Man number two, we can cut off those branches because we've already started exploring. There's no point. So my first version of this cache was a branch cutter. I stored each comic by the comic ID, and my, or my algorithm would say, hey, have we called this comic before? Oh, we have? Great, I won't call it. And this resulted in a very interesting bug, which I'll illustrate via graphs. So let's say we're searching for Spider-Man as our goal character. We start with Squirrel Girl, and we find one connection, another connection, another connection. We find Spider-Man. All of these API calls get cached. Great. Now, let's look for Wolverine. There's been no app refreshes or anything, so we find the very first connection for Squirrel Girl, but we've already called that API, so we don't need to call it. And then we can look for the next one, but we've also already called that one, so there's no point. And then that one's also been cached, and so is that one. And our algorithm's like, hey, no more branches to search, we're done. Which is an ideal, and it made me realize that I didn't want a branch cutter, I wanted something that would fill in that tree. So in order for my cache to fill in that tree, what do I need? I needed something that pending comics could use to DQ with, and something working connections could use to build a connection. And I thought, okay, well before I had my comics cache, if I need to ultimately build up a connection, what if I just cache each connection? So I built this working 
cache, which stored the connection, and then I threw in comics so I could continue exploring the tree. And this worked great, but I had 800 API calls for just the second degree. And when I went into the network tab, I saw a lot of repeat comics being called. I thought, why is that? And I went back to my working cache to figure out what was happening. And it was because I was storing the unique pair between the character and the comic. So my algorithm would ask, hey, Cache, have we seen this comic before? The Cache would say, not with that character, we haven't. And then we'd make the API call anyways. So I had to step back again and ask, what do I need from my Cache? Something pending comics can use to DQ with and something working connections can use to build a connection with. And I thought some more and I realized, oh, my model should be agnostic of where the data comes from. It shouldn't matter if it's coming from the cache or the API. And realizing that made it very obvious that what I wanted was to cache the API response itself. Pending comics already knew how to deal with the API information. So if the cache is shaped the same way, then we know how to DQ a pending comic. And we already know how to build up a connection based on the API. So if the cache is shaped the same way, we already know how to build up a working connection. I didn't have to add any new data types. I didn't have to get fancy. I just had to become more simplistic. So I landed on a comics API cache where I stored each item by the comics API, by the comics ID, because that's how you would call the comics API. And then I have a list of characters where they each have their own comics for the character. So our lesson number two is to cache simply. And did this work? We went from 800 API calls for the second degree to 600 API calls for the second degree. And I saw it actually work. I saw it load up 625 and then say, hey, we already saw those first 25 on the first uh, degree, so we can DQ those. But 600 is still really big especially with a 3,000 rate limit, and this is only for the second degree. So time for our after-school special of write tests. Writing tests helps you iterate when you're dealing with an API rate limit. In the beginning of my project, I would hit, hit my rate limit and be like, I guess I'm done working for the day. <laughs> and then I got closer to the deadline. I was like, I can't be done working for the day. And at the beginning of my project, I did think, should I write this like TDD? I, I, so I didn't write this project until I had proposed the talk. And so I was like, all right, I have a short deadline. It's only me. I'm not putting this into production. Eh, do I really need tests? But that meant I had to keep all of the nitty gritty of how all of those connection trees were building up, how I was translating the API response into a connection and DQing. And then I had parent IDs that were sometimes comics and parent IDs that were sometimes characters. And that was a lot. So I realized that uh, writing tests for a personal project is self-care. So pro tip, listen to Brooke Angel, listen to Tessa Kelly, and listen to me and write some tests. <laughs> so time for a live enough demo. Here's my application. Let's play. So I'm going to narrate this whole thing. Oh, wait, I don't hit the space bar. Whoop, no. Are we not playing? It's responding like it is on my screen. Oh, huh. all right. Well, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> Basically, I search for Wolverine. I have the pending comics and the cache comics. Each of those gets loaded. We see a bunch of things come in. Wolverine is a second degree character, so we see him uh, tick over to the second degree, which loads in a bunch of like 600 API calls for pending comics. We ultimately get a response. When we go search Spider-Man, we are able to see, uh, I clear out the network tab, and then there are no API calls except for to GraphQL, since that's a different shaped response than the REST endpoint. And I promise it works. And if you want to test me on that promise, I have my project up on GitHub. Uh, because of the rate limit, I didn't want to host this, because you'd probably eat through it really quickly. But on my README, I have instructions on how you can get your own Marvel developer API key and how to load that into my project without giving it to all of the people on GitHub. So our lessons learned, when using a third-party API, you need to be flexible, even with the technology you wanted to use. And when you're caching, you should aim for simplicity first. Sometimes you just need to cache the API response. And then we had our after-school special of tests are good, 
more takeaways for you, read Squirrel Girl, support your local comic book store, and if you're interested in talking comics, getting recommendations, or maybe walking to one of the local comic book stores here in St. Louis, you can join hashtag comics on the Strange Loop Slack. Thank you Will Murray and Steve Ditko for creating such a nuts character. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Ryan North who writes the comics, Erica Henderson who drew the comics, Derek Charm who is currently drawing the comics, and Rico Renzi who colors the comics for creating such a unique and charming book. Uh, sadly, Squirrel Girl is coming to the end uh, this year at issue number 50, but to put that into perspective, of the Marvel comics coming out monthly right now, Squirrel Girl is the highest number comic that's not a Star Wars comic. On the developer side, thank you to Dylan Kearns for Elm Graph QL, thank you Nuvum for Marvel QL, and thank you Aaron Vonderhaar for Beautiful Example, without which my UI probably would have just been default HTML styles. Thank you for the ElmConf organizers, and thank you to you, audience member. You can find me online in various forms, at Glittering Katie, and finally, read Squirrel Girl. Thank you so much.